Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 117 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, that is Gavin, and we'll get to Gavin, but Fia! Fia! Yes? Fia! Yes? Talk to us here! Uh, yeah, so last uh, Tuesday, I defended my master's thesis, and then in my private defense, I passed with minor revisions, and I will soon have a degree of master's in science. Woo! Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, still does not feel good. Now, what was it like defending it? So, like, what do you have to do? You go in, like, how many people are in the room? How Mm -hmm. long does it take? I want to know all of it. So, it's a public defense, so anybody in the world with the Zoom link or the address can come and listen to my talk, and then it's a 30-minute-ish presentation about all of the stuff that I did, and uh, they can ask questions at the end. And then after Mm -hmm. that, um, my committee, which are a group of professors that basically decide whether I pass or fail as being a master, (laughs) um, they have like a a private discussion and then they bring me in and then it's just us where they ask me a bunch of questions and uh, mostly related to like my research and uh, the general... uh, idea of what I had been studying and then Mm -hmm. I leave and then they talk a bit see if I answer the questions okay and then they bring me back and then I either pass or fail and I pass Woo! yeah now do you get any sense as to like you said it was pass fail is this like do you have any sense like oh you pass just by the skin of your teeth or (laughs) oh you pass a flying cut like do you get any any sense of that or is it just there are there are like different levels yeah um, um for, go ahead go ahead Fia. for me it it was just you passed and my okay like advisors prepared me and they were expecting me to pass so in the email that i got followed up with like some edits they were like you did a great job you answered everything very well so i take it that i passed like more than just barely <laughs> But yeah. Okay. The, yeah. The, the way it was phrased to me when I was getting ready to defend my masters was like if you fail your defense, like it's one thing if like you take a ton of drafts to get there, but it's like if you get to the point of defending and you fail, that's also kind of on your professor for letting you get that far and not putting in some kind of corrective behavior. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. So it's uh, yeah. But there's as as I understand it, and I'm sure there are you know different you know variations on it. But there's kind of three categories that are uh, technically four, I guess. But um, there's fail. There is pass with major revisions, pass yep. with minor revisions, and then pass mm-hmm. with no revisions, which basically never happens. Um, yeah. <laughs> And so pa- passing with minor revisions is basically as good as you can expect. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And that's that's what Fia did. And that's, you that know, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, it, we're, we're proud to now be a, a podcast sporting two masters. Uh, three masters. All of us are masters. Well, I was going to say, masters, hold on. Masters, like, masters, like, I know. I'm sorry, buddy. Okay. I forgot. Right, like, I get I'm not a science person here, but I mean, you know, I still get some amount of credit. Yeah, absolutely. No, teachers deserve way more credit than they get. Uh. I'll tell you what, the, the degree to teach, um, more more useful than my political science bachelor's degree, <laughs> but not particularly useful. Like, the uh, the actual master's degree, way less useful than, like, three months in a classroom actually teaching. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, a hundred percent. But uh, I, Fia, I just we couldn't be. Pr- I was, uh, I was saying this before we started recording. Everybody, but just these couple of nerds that I met when we were teenagers in upstate New York are now like doing such cool stuff, and they have master's degrees and are like actually out in the world of science, like being real people. I like. I have no reason to feel like a proud father, and yet for some reason I feel like a proud father watching everybody like just blossom like this. It is it is so incredible to see uh, both of you guys being able to do this. So congratulations, Fia. 
Thank you. That's so sweet. But yeah, so with uh, us being a little, you know, mushy out of the way, <laughs> uh, let's let's get into some of our sections of the episode. So I guess, Fia, let's start us off with some housekeeping. Yeah. We're going to make Fia keep house, like, after we just did that. This is awful. You know, I am <laughs> the I am the youngest here. I got my master's degree last. It's it's only fair. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, that's fair. But don't forget to rate the show on whatever platform you listen to. And to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Give us feedback about the show and any future topics you would like to hear on the pod. And then if you would like to be a guest on the show... Be sure to fill out a form, which all this stuff can be found in the show notes. And then as for next episode, what is our topic, Gavin? Yeah, so next week we're going to be talking about uh, a weird piece of anatomy that humans no longer have called a tail. You might have heard of one. Um, Lots of animals have tails. We've done an episode similar to this in the past where we talked about claws and sort of claws versus nails versus hooves and and stuff like that and if i were a good host i'd know what episode that was but i don't um but yeah so we're gonna be talking about tails and and all the different kinds of tails that things can have and why they're surprisingly way more complicated than you might be thinking of just like your your dog or your cat so yeah that will be uh episode 118 two weeks from now awesome but yeah so let's swing it then over to mike for today in history and Seeing as he didn't tell us he was looking it up before we started recording, uh, what do you got for us, Mike? Or am I going to need to make an edit here? No, so uh, so this is partially a today in history, but really it's a okay. transition to today in the present. Okay. Um, so in 1992, uh, what it, well, if I back up for a second here, you two guys have known me long enough here. I'll give you three guesses. What, what is like my number one joy in life? Baseball. Yes. So, uh, in 19, do you, specifically, can we get more specific than baseball? Of, of course I can. Sophia, I think he's talking about the team. Do you know Mike's favorite team? Uh, uh maybe. <laughs> it's the same do, do colors as guess? Syracuse, if that helps. The Mets? Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Bingo. So... I'm um, not a baseball person, so that really came out... <laughs> No, no, it's all good. So in 1992, um, the greatest Met of all time, a guy named Tom Seaver, was actually inducted into the Hall of Fame, August 2nd, 1992, um, along with a couple other players, uh, Raleigh Fingers, Hal Neuhauser, and uh, and Bill McGowan. Um, And for nearly three decades, uh, Tom Seaver held the record um, uh, for highest percentage of the vote to get into the Hall of Fame, uh, done by a New York Met, which is... Yeah, like, us Mets fans don't have a whole lot of um, <laughs> things to hang our head on here. Um, and so he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. But my transition, as we're talking about baseball, is that today, August 2nd, the day this episode goes out, is the trade deadline in Major League Baseball. Um, so there's going to be players getting moved around. Uh, we are recording this on uh, July 30th, so we don't know all the moves. Um, my New York Mets going to be sellers. Uh, we're not good this year. Oh, no. <laughs> We've already traded... We've already traded one of our star, actually two of our star pitchers. Uh, we may be trading, we'll quite likely be trading some other players. Um, and the trade deadline is always a fun time to be a baseball fan, um, just to see like who's going to get moved where and uh, which teams are going to get better and land the star players. So even though the Mets uh, are not going to be uh, acquiring anybody that will help them this year, uh, I am looking forward to just seeing what deals get done right up until the wire. If you're Did a baseball they just fan, get a bunch of draft picks is that what they're getting? So in baseball, you cannot trade draft picks, oh. um, but what they do have is minor league players. Oh, gotcha. Um, what are, yeah, usually called prospects, and so that makes sense. The Mets, you know, yeah, the Mets acquired a 21 year old middle infielder. Um, they acquired two teenagers um, a couple days before that, um, and that's usually what you do. You trade somebody who's really good now in exchange for somebody that you, know, you think will be good a couple years from now. Okay. Yeah, so that is uh, both today today in history as well as today in the present. I believe now uh, we've got some opportunities for Fia to do some Swamp Corner. Yeah. Yes, sir. So today I'll keep it short for you because, well, you find out. But the first, uh, well, one of the organisms I want to talk about that I found in the swamps is Isopoda idotidae. This is a family of isopods that has 
41 genus in six subfamilies. Uh, they can be found uh, all along the coast of the Atlantic, in the Gulf of Mexico, coastal Europe, and then southern tips of South America and Africa. They can live in freshwater, brackish, marine, you name it. Um, but apparently there's not really much information about these guys. I, I looked for a while and found nothing. Uh, even though the most recent species came out in 2017. Uh, so, I mean, it's just amazing to me that there's so many genuses in this uh, family and there's not really much information on them. So I just want to raise awareness for these little ice spot guys and maybe we can learn more about them because they are cool. Absolutely. And then even just like reading this before we started recording, uh, I did. So we have sort of a running list of uh, potential ideas for podcast episodes and I put isopods on the list because they're cool, uh, cool guys. Yes. Uh, and I do, I do like isopods quite a lot. So cool. They're the coolest. They're like, Roly polies, except for I don't think roly polies are actually isopods. Oh, you'd be surprised. True. <laughs> so uh, maybe in a month, maybe episode one nineteen will be isopods. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that, Fia. Uh, today, the main topic of our episode is uh, this old guy named Louis Agassiz. Technically, because it's all eighteen hundreds. Uh, European scientists go. Uh, he has multiple, just like many words to his name. So his technical name is Jean Louis Rudolf Agassiz, or just Louis Agassiz, as uh, he is known to his friends. Uh, wow. And so uh, I sort of teased last uh, episode that, like, however you think you're spelling this, it's probably not correct. Uh, it's A G A S S I Z, which is a little weird for French because I've never seen any word at all that has I and then Z in French. So maybe that's a, yeah. a Swiss French thing. Um, that's sort of the, the area of Europe that this guy is from. And we'll talk a lot more about that as we talk about his life. Um, but this guy uh, lived sort of throughout pretty much all of the 1800s. So he was born in 1807 and uh, died in 1873. Uh, so, didn't live all that long, but saw uh, that was a very active time in world history. Uh, so, uh, he was a major pioneer in several fields of natural science, particularly uh, geology and zoology, which you could probably guess, since we're talking about him here on this podcast. Um, and uh, I also put a little bit of a footnote here, uh, also quite similar to at least one host of this podcast. Uh, from my readings about him, he had really debilitating ADHD and bounced around from project to project a lot. Uh, so when we talk about all the stuff that he did, it will get confusing because a lot of the dates overlap because he's constantly working on many things at the same time. Uh, so I will do my best to keep things as clear as possible for when he was doing what, but it overlaps kind of everywhere. <laughs> uh, right. also a quick, um... So just disclaimer for uh, the end of the podcast, like many uh, European scientists from the 1800s, this guy was very racist, uh, and we will talk more about that at the end, uh, but uh, I just want to say that up front, and I'll be reading some passages that he wrote that will not sound good out of context. Uh, Do they sound any better in context? No, they're still bad. Um, okay, good. I just wanted to, I wanted to make sure here. Yes, no, they're still bad, even with full context, but uh, in case you fall asleep to the podcast and wake up to me saying vulgar things, uh, that's why. So, uh, Agassiz was born in the Swiss town of Motier. Uh, however, it is now uh, the Swiss canton, which is what they call their states or provinces, of Freiburg. Uh, at the time, it was the Rodanic Republic, which was sort of a satellite state of France while Napoleon was running around Europe doing his conquering. Um, so it was not Switzerland as we know it today. Um, but then, you know, throughout his life, it would become the Switzerland that we have today. Um, but as with uh, many European people who were sort of born in this general time period and later became famous, his father was in the clergy. So he was a pastor. 
Uh, and his family had been, so his father's family had been for at least six generations. So this guy is, you know, really well established in the community and has a, generally quite a lot of resources. Um, his mom was also noted as being quite intelligent, which for someone in the 1800s to write about a woman is saying something. Um, particularly from like an upper class white people perspective, they tended to not treat women wonderful in the 1800s. Um, but uh, he was, uh, so his mom was taught a lot by her father, who was a doctor. So she was, you know, fairly well educated for a woman at the time. Uh, and she homeschooled we uh, until about 1818 when uh, he was 11. So at that point, he ended up going to a boarding school near Bern, which is, um, I don't think the capital of Switzerland, but a very well-known sort of cosmopolitan city, um, very worldly city even back then uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and then later, sort of finishing his sort of high school time in a different city called uh, Lausanne. So just sort of had the resources to sort of bounce around to different schools around the country. Uh, after sort of gotcha. graduating and finishing his high school times, uh, he bounced around all sorts of different universities. And this is where I started to be like, okay, this man has some kind of uh, ADD that he's just <laughs> never satisfied <laughs> In yeah. one place, because he, uh, in the years after that, uh, attended the universities of Zurich, Heidelberg, and Munich, all in Germany, uh, where he became very fond of botany. However, that didn't last very long. That's not really what he did for the rest of his life. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so in 1826, so at this point, he is 19. He was selected by two very famous German biologists to sort of take over their research uh, on fish from the Amazon River after uh, at least one, probably both of them, though, became sick with some kind of tropi tro uh, tropical disease that they likely contracted <laughs> while uh, in Brazil. Uh, and his interest in fish, you know, this is sort of where it started, but it would become like sort of what he worked on the most. Uh, not particularly what he's most well known for, but this is what he sort of spent the most time on was working on fish. In 1829, at this point, he's 22. He receives his PhD. And I don't know how uncommon that is for the time, whether that is as young as it sounds in today's sort of academic world. Um, yeah. But regardless, he's quite young. Uh and he earned his PhD working on those fish uh, at the University of Erlangen, which is a fun word, in uh, Nuremberg, Germany. And one year later, he received uh, a an MD, so being like an actual medical doctor, at University of Munich. So again, just bouncing from university to university, uh -huh. getting all sorts of degrees. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I just want to reiterate, by the time he's 23... He's both a PhD doctor and an actual medical doctor. Just in case, Via, you were feeling good about yourself earlier. Thanks. Yeah, it didn't plan yeah. this well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, after finishing his many degrees, he then moved to Paris and studied under uh, a very famous uh, scientist from the time named Alexander von Humboldt, who was a uh, very famous mm. just sort of precursor to a lot of the folks that are generally more famous. Um, he has a lot of things named after him, like uh, Humboldt squid is a very famous species of like a tropical reef squid. Um, but uh, he sort of started the fields of geomagnetism, so like understanding that the Earth is magnetic, uh, and also was very important in the development of like meteorology, so weather. Um, maybe a future episode about him because he's seems to have a very intriguing life. Um, it was also around this time in Paris that uh, Agassiz uh, also studied under our old racist friend, Georges Cuvier, uh, which I didn't know until I was doing mm. this research. I didn't see that come up when I was doing the research for uh, Georges Cuvier. You can hear more about that guy in episode 103. Uh, just know that it gets real sad at the end. Uh, he was not a good person. Uh, but uh, also that should have raised some red flags. Because at this point, when I was reading about uh, Agassi, but none of the racism stuff came up. And then I saw Cuvier's name pop up, and I was like, mm. uh -oh. I debated just switching to the other guy that we talked about maybe doing for this <laughs> episode, but 
Uh, I was like, eh, it's important to teach, you know, the whole of history. But, uh, but basically, during this time in Paris, studying with these guys, uh, Humboldt got him interested in sort of the geology, abiotic side of stuff. And then Cuvier sort of furthered his interest in zoology. And then sort of off he went out into the world. Um, and so his first move was to back to Switzerland uh, at, to, to sort of work on sort of this local region and fully catalog the fish of like this one particular lake that he grew up near in Switzerland. And uh, never content, though, in uh, 1830, he expanded this work from just that one lake to all of Central Europe. And that would be his work for several years, uh, publishing it in sections between uh, 1839 and 1942. However, he was doing stuff all that time as well. He wasn't just working on this thing. So in 1832, so only two years removed from Paris, he took a position at the University of Neuchâtel, uh, near that lake where he started doing that research there. Uh, even though he had been offered, you know, much more high-paying, lucrative jobs in Paris. And uh, apparently he only got paid a salary of $400 per year, which I was like, that's forever ago, so that sounds like it's kind of a lot. But I looked it up, and that's only like $14,000 a year in today's money. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. okay. So, uh, it was interesting, but he, he per, you know, specifically said he took this job because it was more private, and it gave him more time to work on the things that, like, he actually wanted to do. He didn't have to, like, schmooze people in Paris all the time. He just kind of wanted to be left alone with his fish and his lake. <laughs> Don't we all? Which, you know? I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I respect that. Um... However, not too long after starting at that university, the local fish fossils sort of caught his attention because very little study had been done on them. So by this point, like I said, this is like 1830s. Paleontology as its own science wasn't really a thing yet. Like, it, it wasn't, and it wasn't. It was in its very infancy by this point. Uh, he would go on to publish five volumes about these fossil fish uh, between 1833 and 1843. And these gained him a lot of uh, attention, you know, as a researcher, because they contained just really spectacular illustrations of the fossils done by a professional artist, which was not at all common at the time. These days, it's it's a fairly common thing to get uh, fossil, like, reconstructions. You know, if you name a new dinosaur species, you commission an artist who specializes in dinosaurs and things, and they will draw what it may have looked like in life. This isn't quite what they were doing. They just had, like, the fossil, because at this point, photographs didn't really exist yet, so you couldn't take a photo of the fossil and put it, you know, in your paper. You had to... Mo most scientists were fairly good artists, because at, in this day and age, they had to be. Um, but this guy, like, got a professional, really skilled artist to do it for him. Uh, which just sort of put him a step above everybody else. Around this time, uh, so in 1833, he married uh, his first wife, uh, Cecile Braun, sort of a, a sister of another uh, very well-known German botanist. Uh, and she was also an artist, so she was not the same artist that, she, that uh, Agassiz had paid earlier, but she was also a very talented artist who would uh, draw illustrations for his uh, papers and things, uh, you know, throughout their entire marriage. And uh, he, his work on these fossil fish was described as being a real challenge to him because he was used to being able to examine sort of the whole fish with uh, soft tissues and all, which obviously you can't do with fossils. Um, and with fish in particular, uh, their bones are also quite thin and fragile. If you've ever, you know, if you've ever gone really? fishing and then eaten that fish, you'll know their, like, ribs are very, very thin and narrow. Um, and so those don't fossilize particularly well. But what does are their teeth, their scales, and their fins. Because those are, uh, teeth are very hard. Scales are just big plates of bone. And fins are just firmer sections of bone, basically. And have actual sort of substance to them that the, the rest of the body bones kind of don't in fish. Um, but because of this, he developed an entirely new way to classify fish, mostly using their scales 
and split them into four different groups called ganoids, placoids, cycloids, and tenoids. And so those were the names he gave to like the groups of fish that had similar scales to one another. And while this what does pos- that um that suffix mean that uh, that oids o i d s I assume uh circle or ank- okay yeah hmm. um I I believe so I might just be making that up though I believe but, it yeah uh but this classification system itself has kind of been outdated uh but we still use use those words to describe different fish scale morphology so like different types of scales so for example more primitive bony fish like sturgeon and gars have ganoid scales. They're very bony uh, and thick. Um, sharks and rays have placoid scales that have dentin and enamel on them. Uh, cycloid scales are found in some fish like uh, carp and salmon. And tenoid scales are found in many like perch-like fish. So we just sort of took, you know, the names that Agassiz made uh, instead of putting them as like a, a group of fish, as sort of a feature of fish. So you still see little remnants of some of his stuff that we still use today. In the uh, 1830s, so this is throughout the whole decade, he teamed up with a father-son duo, both named Louis de Coulon. Uh, and I don't know whether they were Swiss or French. I didn't find that. Uh, I believe they were also Swiss, but... <laughs> Uh, and they founded basically a local society of natural sciences and a new museum in that small town near the lake. So he's just, you know, really working hard to develop this university and this sort of local area as like a cool place to do science. Uh, and he needed lots of money to make this happen. And since he didn't get paid much, he didn't, he couldn't really pay for it himself. And so some philanthropic scientists and science organizations from Britain, it was never explained to me how he knew them, but uh, they gave him a bunch of money and an award for all his work. Uh, at the young age of uh, 30. Uh, And in uh, 1838, he was selected to be a foreign member of the Royal Society of London, which is, uh, especially at the time, the most prestigious scientific organization in the world. So being 31 at the time, that is uh, very young to be in that very selective club. Um, And then here in my notes... Specifically says, here's where the ADHD comes in. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, he got bored of fish at this point. You know, he had just been named a, an incredibly young <laughs> member of the Royal Society of London. And he was like, yeah, those fish, who needs them? Uh, he moved on to invertebrates, uh, which are Ooh. very common fossils in many of the rocks around the Alps. Uh, so I'm sure that makes Fia's little invertebrate heart happy. Yes. He published a series of monographs, which is just like long, very detailed, very illustrated uh, papers, basically, um, about the recent and fossil echinoderms of Switzerland uh, from 1838 to 1840. Uh, Echinoderms are things like starfish, crinoids, uh, sand dollars, stuff like that. Uh, And also a series called Critical Studies of Mollusks. uh, I'm sorry, Critical Studies of Fossil Mollusks from uh, 1840 to 1845. So he's he's doing all sorts of stuff, uh, but all marine, pretty much. I don't think he ever really did too much with terrestrial fossils. Uh, and throughout his naming of species, I thought it was cool to point out that he actually named two of them after Mary Anning, a uh, very famous fossil collector from uh, the southern coast of England, uh, who also very famously did not get the credit she deserved because she was a woman. Um, but she was a very famous fossil collector and extremely helpful to the early days of paleontology. Um, but he also, in the couple of times that he traveled to England to look at these fossils and stuff, uh, she was incredibly helpful to him, and he named two species after her, which was pretty cool. Uh, arguably, what Agassiz is best known for isn't any of this fossil stuff. If you look up Louis Agassiz Science, you will likely see uh, stuff about him and glaciers. Total pivot. Oh, uh, a- yeah. Again, with, with the ADHD. Glaciers. Yes, glaciers. So, in 1836, so again, all, most of his stuff ended up being published in the late 30s to 40s. Uh, so, in the mid-30s, he took a vacation to a, another town, um, sort of near-ish to Geneva, called Bex, in the foothills of the Western Alps. 
And there he met two scientists named Jean de Charpentier and mm. Ignaz Venets, who had recently published uh, some pretty shocking work about glaciers. Basically, um, they had sort of suggested that large random boulders all across Europe and Asia and North America were placed there by glaciers that had since melted away, which was very unusual to, you know, proclaim in a paper because the concept of an ice age had never been proposed before. Right. So the the whole concept that the Earth was colder and there were giant glaciers that went, you know, fit very far south relative to where they are today, um, just was not a well-known thing yet. Or, or even sort of a, a really, you know, proposed idea. Um, and especially because up till this point, these giant boulders in seemingly random places were seen as evidence of the biblical great flood. So you were kind of questioning the church a little bit by suggesting this. And, you know, in the, now at this point, the middle-ish 1800s, that wasn't so much of a death sentence as it would have been a hundred years earlier, but uh, that was still, you know, a little bit of a taboo. So what happened to him? Well, those do nothing um, that I'm aware of. I didn't really look into it further, but that it was just something that was sort of an unspoken rule that, like, if it's kind of church related, yeah, it's it's kind of best to not question it terribly. Right. Yeah. Not at, n- not at this time. Right. And so, after meeting with these two, who I think were just in the town because there were some glaciers nearby, and he, you know, I'm sure they, if they're, you know, scientists in the same country, especially back then, I'm sure they all were vaguely aware of each other. Um, but he ran into these two, and they told him about the, these new ideas, and he took their ideas a step further and published a whole series of papers suggesting that the whole world had once been in an ice age, and he was the first scientist to actually formally propose this idea. Wow. Uh, And then, after this, Agassiz was like, I guess glaciers are my thing now, because he spent (laughs) a good number of uh, years studying glaciers, and he even built a hut out on a glacier in the Alps that he would live in while he was out there studying them. Just the energy that this guy has. Already. I know, right? Uh, yeah. How? In, yeah. In 1840, he published two volumes called uh, Studies of Glaciers. Pretty simple. Uh, where he fully described the landscapes that glaciers leave behind and how you can sort of recognize them in places that don't have glaciers today. So he sort of compared, you know, this is what it looks like when a glacier pushes a whole bunch of dirt to an area and then recedes. Uh, Because it leaves some very obvious traces if you know what you're looking at. Uh, Later that same year, he also traveled to Scotland with famous geologist William Buckland, who uh, in the later part of the 1800s often traveled around with Darwin. He was one of Darwin's good friends. Um, And there he found very clear evidence of prehistoric glaciations. Uh, you know, in Scotland, I don't believe there are any active glaciers. Well, that might be wrong. But he found in sort of even like the lowlands where you wouldn't expect mountain glaciers to be, he found very clear evidence of these giant boulders in weird places and uh, the soil being very rocky and churned up, which is very, you know, telltale of glaciers as well. Um, and then apparently he went back to fish occasionally <laughs> uh, and published some uh, some papers on some newly found fish fossils that... Uh, that he found while he was in Scotland in uh, 1844. Do you have a total number of how many papers he published? No. And I don't think I want to, because it would be way too (laughs) much. Yeah, all right. Because this guy is literally just a publishing machine. Yeah. Just prolific. Yeah. Because it's like, and I think, like, you know, in some of them I said earlier, he, you know, he published this series between, you know, 1840 and 1845 and it's like each year it seems like he's got like at least five or six uh and these are Uh, like i said like volumes this isn't just like a paper this is like an entire book several times a year wow uh let's see he was also uh sort of like i said the first one to suggest that 
all the rocky, gravelly soil across all of the British Isles, which is, you know, very, like, sort of characteristic of, you know, all of Britain and, and Ireland, um, was due to glaciation. That, you know, these glaciers from sort of the highlands of, uh, like, Scotland would, you know, bring these chunks of rock and, and even just, like, little cobbles and gravels uh, all the way south down to, you know, England. And then when the glaciers melted, all of that stayed. So it makes very jumbled up, not well sort of sorted is the geological term for it, uh, rock, which is why the, all the soil in England is very rocky. Uh, and that later turned out to be correct. Uh, let's see. And so that was sort of the last bit of work that he did in Europe, because in 1846... He was invited to come give a lecture series in the Boston area called The Plan of Creation as Shown in the Animal Kingdom. So it was sort of clear that his, you know, being raised by a member of the clergy had not rubbed off on him or had not, you know, uh, faded away from him in any way. Uh, he was offered many jobs while in the U.S. Uh, and he ended up moving to the United States permanently. Meanwhile, his wife and three children stayed in Switzerland, oh. where she died two years later in 1848. I didn't find of what, but uh, yeah, so she was just hanging out in Switzerland and then died two years after he moved to the United States permanently. Um, I don't, I'm not a marriage uh, expert, but probably not great. Anywho. Uh, he remarried uh, an American woman in 1850, so two years later. What about uh, his kids? And, uh, they uh, moved to the U.S. at that point as well. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, and one of his sons uh, also ended up becoming a, very, a quite well-known scientist later as well. Cool. Um, so throughout all this time, he continued giving that sort of lecture series about, uh, again, the plan of creation as shown in the animal kingdom was the title of it and led to him being among many well-regarded scientists that sort of founded the Lawrence scientific school at Harvard university where he became okay. a faculty member and then later founded the Harvard museum of comparative anatomy in 1859. So he was one of the original sort of, uh, major geologists at Harvard. So Gavin, I think I'm a little confused this plan of original creation, is yeah. this pro-evolution or pro-God made everything? Pro-God made everything. Because, so, um, on Darwin's book on the origin of species didn't come out until 1859. So this okay. was, and he got to the U.S. in 48. Okay. Yeah. Just checking. Yeah, no, that's... That's good. Thank you. Um, also, just a quick uh, central New York connection. Uh, while he was at Harvard, he occasionally also was a guest lecturer at Cornell. Nice. Ew. Yeah. Just adding on to it. Yeah. Uh, and after that, you know, the last couple decades of his life were relatively quiet uh, in terms of, like, publishing and things like that. He definitely settled down in terms of his <laughs> publishing rate once he got to the U.S. Um, but he, he did some lectures here and there, but sort of just kept to the um, sort of teaching of a you know faculty member at Harvard. Although he did make a pretty big trip to Brazil with his uh, with his new wife in 1865 uh, on a research trip to sort of renew his you know fish interest from way back uh, when he was doing his PhD. Um, and then interestingly, I read that the year he died. So you know, he died in, I think, December of that year, but sometime earlier in the year, he was given uh, an island and $50,000, which is about $1.3 in today's money, to start right. a new school for zoology, focusing mostly on marine species. Um, and unfortunately, the school itself only lasted a few years, but the, the bones of it eventually sort of morphed to become the Woods Hole Marine biological laboratory no way yeah which 
That's Fia crazy. as a as a marine biologist. Uh, That's like epic. Knows, that is like the place. Yeah. For marine biology. Yeah. Um, w- where is it? It's, Massachusetts. Yeah, it's like oh. on an island off the coast of Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, he died in 1873 and was buried in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is where Harvard is. Uh, his headstone is made from a glacial boulder from the glacier where his hut was in the Alps. And two pine trees from Switzerland were planted to put shade over his grave. A neat sort of cool, just like little Switzerland connection, which is, I guess, something you can do when you have money is fly a giant boulder halfway across the world. <laughs> so that sort of ends his life as as a researcher. Uh, and now this next section is just called the racism part. Oh, dear. There's yeah. always a racism part. Yeah. So as with any relatively wealthy white scientist in the 1800s, Agassiz was quite racist. Um, I will say not quite as kind of gross about it in terms of like actions as Georges Cuvier was. Because uh, if you go, if you remember or go back into that episode, he was a monster. Uh, uh, Agassiz didn't seem to be quite that bad. But uh, to start off with, he was a major supporter of what is called the polygenism movement, which sort of thought that the different races of humans were created separately and had their own attributes that separated them. Um, <sighs> this became quite popular. Um, I mean, it, it definitely was a thing, like, around the time he got to the U.S., you know, in the um, mid to late 1840s, but also really picked up sort of in response to um, the theory of evolution by natural selection by Darwin. Because Darwin's whole theory, like, insisted that, like, all life has a common ancestor, and the things that are the most similar must have a common ancestor, including humans. Like, all humans must have a common ancestor, and all the racists were like, ew, no. Um, And so this whole movement sort of picked up steam from all the racists um, around that time. Um, when uh, Agassiz first got to the U.S., he became close friends with a man named Samuel George Morton, who was the main, heavy air quotes, scientist, uh, famous for taking skull measurements of skulls from different, you know, places around the world from people of different races and using those measurements some to support... some phrenology here? What's that? It's like phrenology? Yes. He, he was sort of the main person doing that and using that to support white supremacy. Um, Rough. Agassiz sort of took those ideas and ran with them. Um, at one point, giving lectures saying that black people and white people not only were different, but were different species. Oh. Yep. Um, and then in personal letters, so not public things, but he wrote, quote, the production of half breeds is a sin against nature, and also half breeds. Yep. Uh, so unquote, and also quote, we have already had to struggle in our progress against the influence of universal equality, but how shall we eradicate the stigma of a lower race when its blood has once been allowed to flow freely into our children? Unquote. Uh, Absolutely yeah. disgusting. Pure that white supremacist. Yeah. Um, yep. I, not much to add on that. No. Um, so apparently, like, let's very smidge, faintest, faint silver lining. Apparently, he never supported slavery. Uh, but he had a real weird way of showing it, uh, since proponents of slavery used his work a lot, and since he was such a credible scientist, uh, you know would use these lectures and things that he gave, you know, in their propaganda, basically. Mm. Uh, He was also fairly comfortable just being around enslaved people because in 1850, so the year he got remarried, uh, he commissioned a series of uh, real, like, old-timey photographs. It was sort of the first publicly available photography technology 
Um, but he commissioned these photographs of uh, two slaves, one named Renty Taylor and his daughter Delia. And these pictures were taken basically just to show the inferiority of black people and were widely circulated with white supremacist propaganda because they are the earliest ever known photos of enslaved people. And when was this? 1850. Wow. Okay. Uh, Agassiz left those photos to Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. And uh, they sat there in their attic for 126 years when a staff member found them in 1976. Harvard, uh, uh, being the wonderful institution that it is, instead of trying to figure out, hey, who are these pictures? And maybe we should call their family to see like if they're still around, you know? Um, or like their descendants, you know? Uh, nope, they licensed the photos for use and put them on exhibit. Uh, and some of these photos include like nude pictures oh. of enslaved people, which is just gross. Um, and so after a little while, they did try to figure out who the people in the photos were. And in 2011, uh, one of their descendants named Tamara Lanier uh, came forward and asked Harvard to give the, the family the photos instead of continuing to make money off of their enslaved ancestors. Right. Um, Harvard, of course, said no. Uh, and in 2019, so as recent as, you know, four years ago, uh, Lanier and some of the other descendants, uh, so, you know, her family members, sued Harvard for the photos and an unspecified amount of damages. Uh, along with that, 43 of Louis Agassiz's descendants came out and supported the lawsuit, writing a letter of support saying, quote, for Harvard to give the daguerreotypes, which is like the technical name of that type of old-timey photograph, uh, to right. Ms. Lanier and her family would begin to make amends for its use of the photos as exhibits for the white supremacist theory Agassiz espoused. Everyone must be evaluated fully, or um, everyone must evaluate fully his roles in promoting pseudoscientific justification for white supremacy, unquote. My next bullet just says, be like these people. Uh, they realized their ancestor was a jerk and a horrible person. And we're like, hey, I know I didn't do it, but like, hey, maybe we should just take some kind of ownership for this and try to right the wrong however many years later it happens to be. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, be like those people. Yeah. Agreed. Um, yeah, I have nothing left to say. I just, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, I think a lot of the, his sort of personal writings, like those ones that I quoted from earlier came out relatively recently because as far as I know, there hadn't been any controversy around him until, uh, I think around 200 or 200, 2007, um, the Swiss government acknowledged his quote, racist thinking unquote, but declined to rename a mountain that is named after him. Hmm. Uh, however, in 2020, as many sort of racial things around the U.S. began, you know, just barely began uh, to be being addressed, uh, his name started coming off a lot of things, uh, including an, an elementary school in Chicago for some reason. I don't know why his name was ever on that to begin with, because as far as I know, he never made it to Chicago. Uh, hmm. um, it was named after him, but is now named after Harriet Tubman. A big, uh, big improvement. Yep. Uh, a large nature park in Massachusetts named after him is now just called the Monoliths. Uh, and a statue of him outside the psychology department at Stanford University was removed and placed in an area with full context. So not destroyed, not, you know, just put in storage somewhere. It is actually given context um, for Agassiz and his life, um, which I think is the correct thing to do with you know, statues and, and things of people like this. So, in conclusion, a really neat figure in the history of geology. However, horrible racist. Uh, didn't expect that coming in. Didn't know that coming in. Uh, but as soon as I saw that he ran around with George Cuvier for a while, uh, I figured this would get a little bit ugly. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, not surprising at that point. No. So, I will try to do better with uh, picking non-racists, 
for the future. Um, but like I said, I mean, the, it's tough if we're going to keep picking people from the 1800s. Yeah. Like, and it's also tough because it's like, um, I don't want to pick someone who's like still alive. If that makes sense, that goes against the uh, the ethos of the show. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I also, like I said, uh, last episode we I debated doing Louis Agassiz for this episode or Alfred Wegener, and uh, I haven't looked up much about him, but he was at least alive in the 1900s. So um, maybe he's better. We'll see uh, <laughs> if and when we do an episode we'll about him at some point. But um, yeah, also, like I said at the top, you know, it's it's important to talk about these figures and the importance that they play in, you know, the you know, different fields that are studied today, but like it's just as important to talk about, hey, this major figure in the development of what you do for work was a horrible racist. And not just like was a racist, but like actively promoted and did great benefits to the white supremacist movement. Um, yeah. So, anywho, that's all I've got. Um, I'm just also in a weird mood because I saw Oppenheimer today, and I didn't. <laughs> it was a lot. Yeah, I did not see it, so I'm not sure. We can have a um, we can have a bonus feature at some point once all three of us have seen Oppenheimer, <laughs> and uh, in in do another uh. uh movie episode because we've done a couple of those oh yeah a couple fun movies uh there was a preview on oppenheimer for the meg 2 oh which yeah did look like it looked dumb but it did look like a very fun movie i will say just a fun stupid action movie Uh. i'm not above a dumb movie (laughs) not even a little bit (laughs) awesome but uh well this has been episode 100 this has been episode 117 of i wish you were dead a podcast about things that used to be alive My name is Mike, that was Gavin and Thea, and we will see all of you in two weeks. Take care, everybody.